So thank you so much for taking the time for this interview and we welcome you to Qatar. And first thank we'd you. like to know about the role of ICANN and what ICANN does. So sure. tell us a brief about it. Sure. ICANN is a global coordinator of the Internet Domain Name System. Mm -hmm. and that includes all domain names and it includes all internet addresses mm -hmm. and it also includes what are called the protocol and parameter registries. And we're a coordinator of that with policies. We have some operational roles, but mm -hmm. we mostly work with all the different operators around the uh, world. Okay. So are we Okay. So in which countries do you operate and which countries do you have uh, have you worked in? We, well, we have working relationships with 240 countries and territories in the okay. world. Uh -huh. Virtually right. every country and territory wants to have what's called a country code uh, okay. operation. And if they have that, then they're coordinating with us okay. because we coordinate the route of the Internet. All right. So, but you're a non-profit uh, non organization, non-government non organization also, Yes. Right? We're a non-profit, uh, multinational organization. Mm -hmm. So we have legal establishment in California, okay. uh, in Europe, uh, yeah. and uh, so we and we have staff uh, s spread in different places around the world. That's great. So how do you see the future of ICANN as an organization? How will, will it evolve in the future, do you think? Sure, I see ICANN evolving and growing with the internet. We're uh, very much shaped and driven by the ICANN community. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a multi-stakeholder organization, mm -hmm. and so we have many different stakeholder groups that mm -hmm. include groups such as the, the ISPs or the country code operators mm -hmm. or the governments that have formed the uh, government advisory committee, mm -hmm. civil society, nonprofits, mm -hmm. uh, all different kinds of business groups, etc. So it's a very rich uh, multi-stakeholder organization. I see that continuing, mm. but we see more parties getting involved in mm. working with ICANN, okay. uh, particularly with international domain names uh. helping to spread uh, far and wide around the world. Okay, so what's the impact of the internationalized uh, domain names in the region? How do you see the impact happening in the, in the Arab region? Sure, well the uptake has been very good. Uh, mm -hmm. As we see we're thrilled to see Dot Qatar launched mm -hmm. here in Qatar mm -hmm. and hope that that will be very popular amongst mm -hmm. users and businesses here. Mm -hmm. That's up for the local users to decide. Mm -hmm. uh, other countries in the region are adopting internationalized domain names as well and around the world. We have 22 internationalized domain names have been entered uh, into the route uh, okay. already and there's others that are in the application pipeline. Uh -huh. So the program's off to a good start and it helps the users because if for example you're using your keyboard in Arabic, yeah. you know, typing a word processing or document, yeah. well then you can type uh, a web address in Arabic yeah. if the uh, company or the group, the website has a Arabic address without having to switch keyboard modes. Mm. So it's really about user convenience mm. and it's about operating in your own language. Mm. So making how, oh yeah, go on. So that's, that's it? That's it, well, and, and, and helping to make the internet more accessible for okay. all people. So how does that impact the uh, availability or the um, probably the increase of Arabic e-content in the region? How do you see that as a... As a we'll as a we'll see. You know, the program is still early um, mm. in terms of it's only been in the last year that mm. we've been at making these additions to the route. Yeah. Uh, so we haven't heard any formal reports on content. We've heard it is popular. Uh, like, for example, in Russia, I think they uh, added over a half million Mm -hmm. new domain names in Cyrillic okay. uh, just in the first six months. So very uh, successful program mm -hmm. uh, and which obviously shows the popularity in that geography mm -hmm. and we'll see in others. But mm -hmm. at least it gives consumers and businesses the choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, there has been a meeting with, I, with between ICANN and some governments um, re uh, regarding the new GTLDs. So can you update us on the progress that's being uh, that's taking place now regarding uh, the new generic top-level domain? Sure. Uh, there's a group of governments called the Government Advisory Committee okay. that has approximately 109 governments involved okay. that uh, advises the ICANN board. Mm. And that's defined in our bylaws, which okay. is a multi-stakeholder document, mm. that our board must consider advice from what we call the GAC, or Government Advisory Committee. So we just had a meeting for two days in Brussels, uh, and it was uh, one of the first formal pre-consultations between the board and the GAC. Okay. We had excellent discussions, mm. no final decisions were taken, mm. but before we went into the meeting, the GAC provided 28 pages of 
detailed information mm. on changes they would like to see in the mm. program. And the ICANN board met with them and mm. met privately and had many uh, in intensive sessions to try to see uh, which areas uh, that some changes might be made in. Mm. And hopefully there'll be more news on that front soon. Mm. Okay, so what's the benefits of the GTLDs? And some people can say that they're confusing. Is that true? And why, why do you think they're useful? And well, you know, in general, technology benefits humans when it gives them more choices mm -hmm. and when humans can go and innovate. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about the Internet and technology is that when you open up new spaces and new technical options, you often can't predict where that innovation is going to go, which yeah. is why we call it innovation, because mm -hmm. it's not predictable, it's yeah. creative. So uh, uh, fundamentally, we just see it as offering more cho choices to consumers. Mm -hmm. And when ICANN was established in 1998, it was drafted in the original concept papers, the white paper and the green papers, that we should be creating new generic top-level domains mm -hmm. to add consumer choice. Mm -hmm. We have done that. We've already added others to the root of the internet. Mm -hmm. And this will be the third round uh, of adding new generic top-level domains when the program opens. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, for the IPv6, what's the ICANN role in speeding the adoption of, of, of the IPv6 in the region? Sure, we, we have a limited role, I would okay. say, in speeding adoption. We do some awareness. Uh, we clearly, we have a, an important uh, a technical role uh, mm. in allocating and assigning the IPv6 addresses yeah. to the regional internet registries mm. that then assign and allocate them to their customers yeah. uh, and members in their regions around the world. Yeah. So we have mostly a coordination role uh, uh, globally in uh -huh. allocating. We do some education and some outreach, but most of that's really done by our partners, the regional internet registries, okay. and by the technology companies around the world uh -huh. uh, that are pushing the adoption and embedding IPv6 okay. into their uh, technology and their offerings. And for those who are not really aware what, about the difference between IPv6 and IPv4, uh, so can you tell us the difference in, in, a, in a brief? Sure. I mean, technically, the difference is is that IPv4 addresses are 32 bits or okay. zeros and ones, yeah. you know, in computer terms, and IPv6 addresses are 128 bits. Okay. Or numerically, IPv4 we have approximately 4.3 billion addresses, and ICANN has allocated all of those okay. to the regional internet registries, uh -huh. except for a small block that we, we handle technically in some coordination roles. Mm. Uh, on IPv6, there's, there's more IPv6 addresses than there are stars mm. in the universe. Wow. There's 340 trillion, 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 okay. because the number is, is approximately you know, 2 raised to the power of 128. Mm. Okay. So my final question would be, when do you expect the GT GTLD's application process to start, and what are you doing in that regard? Well, we're working extremely hard with our board, mm. uh, with the GAC. Uh, we've worked very hard uh, historically with all the, uh, the different groups in the communities that have provided input, yeah. and we're seeking to uh, resolve the last issues in the program. Yeah. Um, successfully so that the board can reach a decision. Mm. The program will launch after the board takes a decision mm. to do so. Mm. And we can't predict at this time when that will be because mm -hmm. it depends on exactly how they choose to uh, work on any remaining issues. Oh, okay. And the staff's role and the organization's role is to support the board in that uh, deliberation process mm -hmm. and to develop the documents and what we call the draft applicant guidebook. Okay and okay. other information for the program. Okay, uh, that was really insightful interview. Thank you so much for your time. Thank and you. And wish you the best of luck. Thanks a Thank lot. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.